everyone. I'm sorry for being a little bit late here. It's um, nice to have this hearing underway. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you particularly to Senator Hassan for visiting to um, introduce a New Hampshire uh, witness. Um, would you like to do that right now first before my opening statement and be on your way? Does no, your schedule I, allow you to I, stick I, around I'm for the statement? I'm going to stay around for both statements and then I'll do the introduction. Okay, right super. Um, Ranking Member Grassley, members of the committee, witnesses and guests, welcome to our 14th hearing on the economic dangers associated with climate change that affect the federal budget. Last week, again, one of my colleagues across the aisle questioned this series of hearings. It is a common Republican refrain. But if you've been listening, you've heard over and over again from highly credible witnesses about economy-wide threats from climate change. We have heard warnings from economists, scientists, medical professionals, insurance and investment executives, even a former Republican Senate majority leader. They warn of danger ahead. Please remember that we are operating under an agreed budget for both this fiscal year and next. The Fiscal Responsibility Act passed in June of last year with support from Republicans on this committee set a two-year budget framework. So we have a budget through to October of 2025. So it makes sense to look ahead. And if you look at our national debt, about a third of it comes from emergencies. If we'd been better prepared, the national debt would be much less. These climate hearings have focused on a huge emergency bearing down on us. The fact that the climate emergency is one that Republicans and fossil fuel polluters would prefer not to talk about doesn't make it any less real. Facts are facts, and physics is physics. There's a pattern here. We offer warnings, Republicans mock the warnings, and then the news proves the warnings true. We held a hearing warning about sea level rise and storm impact on property values driven by uninsurability. And we are witnessing the property insurance market circling the drain in Florida. No insurance, no mortgage, no mortgages, very hard to sell your property. We held a hearing warning about wildfire risk, and this month the Smokehouse Creek Fire in Texas, the state's largest fire ever, burned more than 1.2 million acres, killing livestock, destroying crops, and hammering Texas's agricultural sector. With home insurance premiums already sky high, partly from climate risk, many residents didn't have homeowner's insurance. Again, no insurance, no mortgage, no mortgages, hard to sell your property. We held a, hear a hearing warning about supply chains, susceptibility to climate risk, and we're witnessing extreme drought reducing water levels in the Panama Canal so low that shipping is down nearly 40% from last year, pushing up prices. Recently, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell warned that inflation is being driven by climate change, driving up insurance costs. It's climate inflation. We had a hearing on climate disasters and disaster costs, and just the last year, the United States suffered a record-breaking 28 separate billion-dollar disasters, pushing up prices and burdening the budget. These mounting disasters pose systemic risks to our economy. For those who have not been paying attention, look up what a systemic risk is. Some of the econo economic hits from climate change are sector-specific, which brings us today to the climate-related threats to the outdoor recreation industry. Outdoor recreation is not just an essential part of American culture, it's also an important part of our economy. 1.1 trillion in economic output and almost 5 million jobs. Each year, Americans spend hundreds of billions of dollars exploring the outdoors, hunting, fishing, hiking, skiing, camping, canoeing, and sailing. A lot of family memories are made outdoors. Communities across the country count on outdoor recreation to attract residents and visitors, creating jobs and economic development. Utah, for instance, has seen businesses locate there for its robust outdoor recreation opportunities. And employees head there for that same reason. 
Winter sports have been a huge economic driver in Utah and states across the country. But climate change is wreaking havoc on communities and industries that depend on snow. Wisconsin got so little snow this year that the Small Business Administration extended disaster coverage to affected businesses. Ski areas across the country struggled to operate in warmer winters. The Teton Pass ski area in Montana was only open four full days this year. Hunting seasons change as climate change forces animals into new migratory patterns. Arkansas, the duck capital of the world, has seen fewer mallards migrate through the state. The Game and Fish Commission estimates that duck hunting generates $70 million in economic activity there each year. Warming streams and rivers jeopardize the fishing industry in the communities that rely on fishing. Montana, the unofficial fly fishing capital of the United States, gets an estimated $900 million a year from fishing. But warming streams and declining trout populations are threatening local shops, restaurants, guides, and lodges. Storms also drive away tourism. 2022's torrential rains flooded Yellowstone National Park, destroying roads and closing park entrances at the height of the tourist season, depriving the local economy of the seasonal boon that usually carries them through the year. We've spent these hearings discussing the economic dangers of climate change, which are real and which are large. But it's also worth remembering the losses that can't be quantified. The fishing place your grandfather took you where you can't take your granddaughter. Your Glacier National Park losing its glacier. The quiet now on lakes that once froze over and rang with the cheerful noise of pond hockey. Once cold streams, now barren of trout, near campsites ringed by dead trees killed by bark beetle. Fish kills and algae fouling beaches and bays. Yes, there are huge economic stakes to ignoring climate change. But there is also harm to our way of life, to our traditions, to our family memories, to our connection to the land and waters, which is yet another reason why Congress must get serious about the carbon pollution that is costing us all so much. With that, let me turn to my distinguished ranking member and then to Senator Hassan for her introduction. Um, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, you referred to the common refrain of Republicans. Are you ready to hear some more of that common refrain? I fully expect it, my friend. I fully expect it. Okay. This is not my first rodeo talking about this issue in this committee. Okay. Uh, last week, Senator Romney said the truth out loud. There is, quote, no work being done by this committee to deal with our budget and to deal with federal spending, end of quote. Senator Romney also said, quote, this committee needs to stop acting for the cameras and start working for the American people to finally deal with the massive deficit and debt that we have, end of quote. That sounds kind of reasonable to me. I've been saying this for 15 climate change hearings and counting. Today, rather than working on a budget to curb spending, we're discussing the impact of climate change on outdoor recreation. Democrats pretend that the Fiscal Responsibility Act included a budget for 2024 and 25. In fact, Congress is operating under a so-called deeming resolution that's supposed to be a temporary placeholder until a complete, uh, we complete a real budget. It's uh, no substitute for serious fiscal plan based on bipartisan input that incorporates new tools to enforce fiscal discipline. This committee has sole responsibility to produce such a budget. If we don't, no other committee will. The same can't be said on the subject of outdoor recreation. Senator Brasso and Manchester Manchin are working diligently together to pass a bipartisan outdoor recreation legislation at the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Senator Ernst and Shaheen held a similar small budget hearing outdoor recreation a few months back. Uh, I know Iowans enjoy outdoor recreation as much as anyone. 
whether it's hunting, fishing, hiking, camping, boating, Iowans uh, have plenty to offer. Uh, not to brag, Mr. Chairman, but Iowa, in fact, has three times as many ski areas as Rhode Island. Uh, we have three. You have one. Outdoor record. Low bar. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> New Hampshire might be able to weigh in here. Okay. <laughs> Outdoor recreation plays an important role in our national economy. In uh, 2022, outdoor recreation contributed $564 billion to our gross domestic product. But this committee has bigger fish to fry last year. Interest alone on the national debt cost taxpayers $659 billion, and the interest costs are projected to exceed $1 trillion within two years. It's time that we stopped ignoring the Congressional Budget Office's repeated warnings about our unsustainable debt and the serious risks it poses to our economy. Yes, climate change also poses a risk to our economy, but its risk to outdoor recreation is far from clear. Peer-reviewed research in this area is sparse. To the extent it exists, several studies suggest it could be a boon for many parts of the industry. Not even President Biden's U.S. Department of Congress has published any data or research indicating impending turmoil in the outdoor recreation economy due to the climate change. Now, this hearing may add evidence uh, where the Department of Commerce is short. I hope so. My Democrat friends on this committee consistently complain about an alleged lack a bipartisanship when it comes to climate policy. But then they use climate change, smoke and mirrors, to ignore, ignore our immediate responsibilities as legislators. It's no wonder Americans are fed up with Washington. It's also no wonder participation at these climate hearings has faded. Uh, Senator Romney and I both believe climate change is a significant problem, but neither of us can support this agenda for the Budget Committee. Our constituents deserve a Budget Committee that focuses on the budget. That's why I'm excited to welcome Professor Holmes from uh, Wharton School of University. Uh, I'm going to be introducing him in a minute and our other one, so I will end my statement here at this point. I'm eager to hear how climate change uh, and outdoor recreation groups uh, uh, use uh, some of their resources uh, to uh, bolster uh, this uh, agenda that you've laid out for us, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Grassley. We have five witnesses today, including a witness from New Hampshire, who will be introduced by Senator Hassan. I want to thank Ms. Teresa McKenney for being here and turn to Senator Hassan for the introduction. Well, thank, uh, thank you very much, Chair Whitehouse and Senator Grassley, and to my colleagues on the committee. I am really pleased and honored to be here today to introduce Teresa McKenney, who is the Director of Sustainability and Government Affairs at Nemo Equipment, an innovative outdoor gear brand based in Dover, New Hampshire. Teresa has strong expertise in developing and selling sustainable goods, and I know that the committee will benefit greatly from hearing from her today. Nemo's camping and outdoor gear makes it easier to enjoy the natural beauty in New Hampshire and across the world. Nemo's founder, Cam Brenzinger, started the company in 2002 after camping on Mount Washington, New Hampshire's and the Northeast's highest peak, which is known as, I think, you, all, you know, uh, Senator Whitehouse, for its erratic and dramatic weather. And Cam Brenziger realized that existing tent designs needed to be improved. He invented a low-pressure inflatable structure for backpacking tents that could withstand the higher and highest winds. That innovation became the basis for the company's first product line. Over the years, Nemo has continued to develop new designs and has earned accolades for its products. I most recently visited Nemo in January to tour its facility in Dover. It was clear from my visit that sustainability and advocacy for people and the planet are central to Nemo's mission. 
The company not only depends on a thriving outdoor recreation economy, but also on businesses, communities, and governments working together to support innovation and protect outdoor spaces for future generations. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention Nemo's recent contribution of sleeping bags to the New Hampshire humanitarian aid group called Common Man for Ukraine. This gear will help Ukrainian orphans and displaced families survive the war. So it is a true honor to introduce Nemo today. Thank you, Teresa, for being here to share Nemo's insights and this with this committee and for proudly representing the values that Granite Staters live every day. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Chair Whitehouse. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, our next witness is Ms. Hillary Hutchison. Ms. Hutchison has fly fished nearly all her life. Uh, I have walked trout streams disentangling my line from bushes and trying to undo wind knots and never managed to get much actual fishing done. Um, she currently guides at Glacier Anglers and owns and runs a fly shop, Larry's Fly and Supply, in her hometown of Columbia Falls, Montana. We welcome her extensive experience on the water in, in Montana's streams. Next, we have Mr. Gus Schumacher, an American cross-country skier and Olympian, who last month became the first American man to win a World Cup cross-country skiing distance event in 40 years. Mr. Schumacher hails from Wisconsin, grew up in Alaska, and travels the world to compete in skiing events. He brings us the perspective from the snow sports industry. I now turn to my friend Senator Grassley to introduce the Republican selected witnesses. Dr. Jua Holmes is a professor of finance and economics and senior vice dean, research centers and academic initiatives at Wharton School, University of Penn. Uh, he is also a visiting scholar for the U.S. Federal Reserve. His expertise is on the role of financial markets to the macro economy. We'll hear also from Mr. Scott Walter, president of Capital Research Center. He served as special assistant to the president of the United States for domestic policy. He was also vice president at the Philanthropic Roundtable. Uh, Walter has written for and been quoted in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and Chronicle of Philanthropy. Thank you for coming. Uh, Ms. McKinney, you are first up. Thank you so much for being here. You have five minutes to deliver your testimony, and your full statement will be made a part of the record, as it will be the case for all of the witnesses. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Chair Whitehouse, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on climate-related costs in the outdoor recreation sector. It is an honor to be here. My name is Teresa McKenney, and I'm the Director of Sustainability and Government Affairs at Nemo Equipment, an independent, family-owned camping gear brand based in Dover, New Hampshire. Nemo was founded in 2002 by our CEO, Cam Brensinger. An avid climber and mountaineer, Cam designed our first tent after a rough night winter camping on New Hampshire's tallest peak. We filed our first patent over 20 years ago and have since designed innovative tents, sleeping bags, sleeping pads, camp furniture, and carry systems. While our team of 50 is small, we have an outsized impact. According to 2023 industry sell-through data, Nemo is the number one best-selling brand of camping gear in U.S. specialty outdoor retail. Nemo is part of the outdoor recreation economy. Outdoor recreation generated $1.1 trillion in economic output in 2022, contributing more than mining, utilities, and agriculture to U.S. GDP. According to the latest Bureau of Economic Analysis data, the outdoor recreation economy grew 2.5 times faster than the U.S. economy and generated 5 million jobs. More Americans are participating in outdoor recreation than ever. The outdoor recreation participant base has grown each of the last eight years. New Hampshire's own White Mountain National Forest reported a 40% increase in outdoor recreation between 2015 and 2021. Although outdoor recreation has been surging, Nemo faces challenges. Our continued success is threatened by a long list of global issues, including high interest rates, a cautious consumer market, and trade uncertainties. Running a business will always come with challenges, but we believe that the climate crisis is the greatest threat to Nemo's longevity and to the future of outdoor recreation in America. Along with the risk to human lives and livelihoods, Climate change poses a real and imminent threat to Nemo's business. 
Without safe, accessible, and enjoyable places to recreate, there is no longer a need for our gear. We are already feeling the negative impacts of extreme weather and climate change on our state's outdoor economy. Outdoor recreation accounts for 3.2% of New Hampshire's GDP and grew 18.1% between 2021 and 2022. Small businesses are the backbone of New Hampshire's outdoor industry, including guides, outfitters, retailers, and campground operators. Many of these businesses are based in rural areas and are seasonal. The success of the small businesses in our industry depends on stable, predictable weather and seasons. The summer of 2023 was the wettest on record in New Hampshire, with 21 inches of rainfall negatively impacting the camping season. New Hampshire issued 38 flash flood warnings during the month of July alone. From 1982 to today, New Hampshire has experienced 21 separate billion dollar weather related disasters. Research suggests that extreme weather events are expected to increase in our state. This month, New Hampshire State Parks published a statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. As part of this process, over 300 local outdoor recreation providers were interviewed about the impact of climate change on our industry. 87% of providers reported that shorter winter seasons impact outdoor recreation. 86% reported damage to recreation infrastructure. Economic impacts were reported across every operational measure surveyed, including maintenance, finances, and planning. At NEMA, we felt the impacts of recent volatile weather through overstock issues and order cancellations from retailers in New England and beyond. In New Hampshire, 2023 was the third warmest winter on record, followed by the wettest summer on record, and now 2024 has been the warmest winter on record. Local retailers have their cash tied up in ski clothing and gear, leading to less open to buy for our spring and summer camping goods. Negative impacts of climate change are already affecting small businesses in the outdoor recreation economy. We do not only look to government to solve this problem. Businesses like ours that manufacture goods are contributors to this issue, and we are ready to take responsibility for our part. In 2020, NEMO publicly announced a commitment to reduce our carbon intensity in half by 2030. Thus far, we've achieved a 22% reduction in emissions intensity per product. Businesses like NEMO are stepping up, but will need the government to support the economic resiliency of the outdoor sector. Opportunities include passing America's Outdoor Recreation Act and the Explore Act, bipartisan, bicameral bills that will provide support and flexibility to outdoor recreation businesses, protection of the climate investments made in the Inflation Reduction Act, and modernization of the Farm Bill to support outdoor recreation, access, and climate resilience in rural communities across America. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we welcome the opportunity to work with Congress on this important issue so Americans today, tomorrow, and 50 years from now can enjoy time outside at the campfire, on the summit, at the fishing hole, or in their backyards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Hutchinson, please proceed. Chairman Whitehouse, Ranking Member Grassley, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to connect on the impacts of climate change on the outdoor recreation economy as well. As a full-time fly fishing guide, outfitter, and shop owner near Glacier National Park, Montana, my career is one of the 29,453 jobs directly supported by outdoor recreation in our state. As the outfitter of record for the largest and longest running commercial river company in the Northern Rockies region, with 185 employees, including 100 river guides, I feel responsible for livelihoods beyond my own. My fellow guides and I offer an excellent experience to the many of the 12.5 million people who visit our state each year, spending $5.82 billion. More than 700,000 visitors book a guided trip through an outfit like mine every year in Montana. Water-based activities represent the largest guided trip sectors, and guided fishing trips bring in about $80 billion a year. We love our jobs. Unfortunately, our increasingly unstable river, river office environment, marked by drastic temperature fluctuations, wildfires, floods, droughts, wildlife stress, and other disruptions, warrants extra attention to guides' physical and mental health something that my company recognizes as an essential corporate expense. There's even a nonprofit crisis hotline that's dedicated to professional outdoor guides in Montana and in Idaho, with an increasing number of calls coming in because of environmental stressors. The cost of doing business should keep me up at night, it should keep me on my toes, so it is my job to think about what is driving these new numbers and how we can work with you to keep it all in balance. More than 3 million people visit Glacier National Park each year to catch a glimpse of its diminishing glaciers and enjoy the landscape that those features carved. The crown of the continent stands as one of the planet's last relatively intact ecosystems, and I'm thrilled that a bucket list item for many anglers around the world is con to connect with a wild, native, West Slope cutthroat trout 
in an intact ecosystem. Anglers are also increasingly aware of how human-caused climate change affects this delicate balance. Clients who spend money to fish with us are asking tough questions these days. They ask about our new normals, like unseasonable rain on snow events that can scour trout spawning beds. They ask why we run out of water so early in the season. They ask why they're seeing so many weakened hybrid trout. We're fortunate to have some of the world's top climate scientists located in our big outdoor classroom. So we refer to their research to explain how warmer water is hospitable to non-native species that can eke out native trout populations. We invest in extra education for guides who are becoming accustomed to citing scientific evidence. Today, guides explain why we keep trout in the water instead of lifting them up into the boat for a photo. We explain the government-imposed rules called hoot owl regulations that prohibit fishing when the river's too hot. Trout mortality goes up drastically when they are caught and released in waters that are warmer than their optimal survival range. I think about budgets all the time. It's becoming increasingly challenging to budget for the season. Will we have dangerously high water or historically low water? Should we not book guests in August when thick smoke from wildfires might keep us off the river again? How many client trip deposits will we have to refund because of canceled vacations? How many guides should we hire given all this uncertainty? A recent report underscores the economic jeopardy posed by climate change, predicting the potential loss of 8,800 outdoor recreation jobs and a staggering $263 million in labor earnings annually by mid-century in Montana alone. This includes anticipated declines in visitation to Glacier and Yellowstone. Something that helps me work through my budget concerns is my connectivity to the greater fishing community. I'm able to share best practices with my colleagues in Florida, Maine, Texas, Oregon, and Alaska who are dealing with equally distressing challenges and who are painfully impacted by the deterioration of our fisheries. I'm encouraged by the historic ability of the federal government to listen to people who are the voice of the river. I'm fueled by the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act of 1968, which offers appropriate levels of federal protection to important watersheds. This legislation not only safeguards certain rivers from development, but also fosters economic vitality by recognizing their outstandingly remarkable values. I'm grateful for the bipartisan management that transcends political boundaries, fostering public participation in river protection. As guides, we are told that we have the best job in the world. We're in the perfect place, doing the perfect thing, having perfect adventures. So it can feel pretty weird to point out to you today that it's not all perfect. But all three of my adult children's have, children have jobs in outdoor rec. They have been dealing with the impacts of climate change their entire lives. Standing up for rivers is a thread woven through our family structure. So for my kids, who became my coworkers, for the river professionals who are among the finest humans on earth, for our guests and in the face of these environmental challenges, I implore our leaders to prioritize decisive action on climate change. The future of our environment, economy, and community is a package deal and it is directly connected to our collective efforts to safeguard our planet for generations to come. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Hutchinson. Mr. Schumacher. Hello. Thank you for having me here, Chairman Whitehouse, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify today on the critical issue of climate change and its impacts on outdoor recreation. My name is Gus Schumacher, and I'm a world champion Nordic skier. I just finished my racing season after having been the third ever American male to win a World Cup race. I was born in Wisconsin and grew up in Anchorage, Alaska, where I currently live, and I have spent much of my life immersed in the beauty and challenges of outdoor activities. I come before you today not only as a professional athlete, but also as a concerned citizen troubled by the effects of climate change on our environment and the activities we cherish. As a skier, I have witnessed firsthand the profound alterations to our natural landscapes and the diminishing opportunities for outdoor recreation. Climate change has dramatically altered the conditions for winter sports, including Nordic skiing. Rising temperatures have led to shorter and more erratic winter seasons, with snow cover becoming increasingly unreliable. The delicate balance required for these optimal skiing conditions, sufficient snowfall, cold temperatures, stable weather, is being disrupted at an alarming rate. This unpredictability not only affects recreational opportunities, but also jeopardizes the economic viability of communities reliant on winter tourism, like those Wisconsin communities you mentioned earlier. Additionally, the loss of snowpack in glaciers due to warming temperatures threatens the long-term viability of skiing regions. Glacial retreat not only diminishes the aesthetic appeal of our landscapes, but also impacts water resources vital for snowmaking, 
which further exacerbates the challenges faced by ski resorts and outdoor enthusiasts. These environmental changes wrought by climate change have cascading effects on ecosystem and wildlife habitats. So it's us and the wildlife that are affected, but including this, or through this, in, as my career as an Olympian, I've seen canceled races and races that struggled to run. For example, this winter I raced in Cable, Wisconsin at the American Berkebeiner, which is the largest public ski race in the US, which had to run on a 10K artificial snow loop, unlike its normal point-to-point -point 50K race, which led to fewer participants and also, as I've heard from my sponsors, much less purchasing of skis across the country. Amidst these challenges, though, lies an opportunity for action. As a nation, we have the capacity and responsibility to mitigate the impacts of climate change and safeguard our outdoor heritage for future generations. Investing in renewable energy, promoting sustainable land management practices, and supporting initiatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions are critical steps in addressing the root causes of climate change. We must also prioritize adaption measure, adaptation measures to ensure the resilience of our communities and outdoor recreation infrastructure in the face of a changing climate. This includes investing in snowmaking technologies, diversifying recreational offerings, and fostering partnerships between government agencies, businesses, and nonprofit organizations to enhance climate resilience. The impacts of climate change and outdoor recreation are undeniable and demand current urgent action. I'm one of the millions who represent this outdoor state and its trillion dollar value that contributes to a large portion of our economy. As stewards of the planet and custodians of our outdoor heritage, we have a moral imperative to confront the challenges of climate change head on and preserve the natural wonders that enrich our lives. By working together, we can build a more sustainable and resilient future for all. Thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Gomes. It's pronounced Gomes, correct? That's okay. Correct. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse, Senator Grassley, members of the committee. I am the Senior Vice Dean for Research at the Wharton School, but my remarks today reflect only my personal views. Climate change is unquestionably a very serious issue, but our rapidly darkening fiscal outlook will soon make investments to address it virtually impossible. I know you're probably very tired of hearing economists like me come here and lecture you on numbers you already know. I'll do my best not to do that, and instead use my testimony to make three somewhat different points. First. I'll tell you a story. It takes place in the not too distant future. It starts with yet another major recession or financial crisis where the federal government feels compelled to intervene to recapitalize banks or stimulate the economy. But unlike 2008 <coughs> or 2020, the sharp increase in federal debt proves unpalatable to domestic and global investors who balk at the idea of financing it. The onset of our fiscal reckoning will be very sudden. Government debt yields will jump more than 2% in the first few weeks. Mortgage rates will increase even more, reflecting significantly higher risk premium. The Federal Reserve's attempt to stabilize the bond market through extensive bond buying will undermine confidence in its inflation-fighting commitment and will backfire badly. The dollar is going to fall 10% on impact and more than 20% in the following years. It will never again regain reserve currency status. More disturbingly, the Treasury is forced to adopt significant deficit reduction measures to restore any confidence in the U.S. bond market. This will further devastate our economy, compounding the decline in projected tax revenues, undermining our commitments to social programs and public investments. An aging and discouraged labor force will permanently disengage from work, and our economy will experience a decade-long stagnation. I can see this very clearly in my head. I have seen it before, many times, elsewhere in the world, and in cities such as New York and Detroit. I just can't tell you when it will take place. It might be after 2040. It could be closer to 2030. Or it could be as soon as next year. But its consequences will be severe and leave lasting and probably irreversible scars on our economy and society. Second. Changing this future is not that difficult, but you must act now. I estimate that all that is required is a fiscal adjustment in the order of 400 to $450 billion, or 1.5% of GDP, 
possibly spread over two or three years to mitigate its impact on the economy. That would still leave room for the budget deficit of around $1 trillion or so. That is hardly a radical request. It's just a plea for basic fiscal responsibility. But wait another 10 years, and the required cuts will be twice as painful. And the trillion dollars or so committed to the excess debt service over the coming decade will no longer be available to fund Medicare benefits, national defense, or green investments. Third, the window for our fiscal correction is closing a lot more quickly than you think. Interest rates are expected to be much higher in the coming decade, even without a full-fledged crisis. The post-2000 global savings glut is morphing quickly into a mega investment cycle that will significantly, they'll create significant upward pressure on real interest rates. The ongoing trends towards automation, artificial intelligence, green energy, together with an urgency to build a more resilient global supply chain, all point to new investments on an unprecedented scale. Our own Wharton budget model forecasts an increase in real interest rates of more than 3% over the next 10 years, and that might prove too conservative. But even under the most optimistic projections, the cost of servicing existing debt becomes unbearable around 2040, 2045 at the very latest, with higher interest rates creating a relentless spiral that greatly compounds our fiscal challenges. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Gomes. Mr. Walter. Chairman Whitehouse, Ranking Member Grassley, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the honor of testifying. Like the rest of the panel and most committee members, I have no expertise in climate science, but I do have expertise in political operations that camouflage themselves as grassroots groups while quietly exploiting complicating funding streams enriched by billionaires. Some people call this dark money. The phenomenon often appears in environmental debates, including pressure groups that claim to represent outdoor recreation interests, but receive cash from billionaires and other elite political operatives for crude political purposes. Take Patagonia, whose owners donated billions in company stock to a series of 501c4, or dark money, groups. Initial reports said the money would go only to save the planet, but even the New York Times, fooled at first, investigated and found monies going to political machinations like saving the seats of the majority's congressional delegation and pushing non-environmental issues like abortion. This Patagonia network of dark money nonprofits already has an FEC complaint because it appears to have falsified the actual sources of its contributions to the Senate Majority PAC and others. Now consider an environmentalist group that's received Patagonia funding. Protect our winters or POW. Protect Our Winners claims it's just helping passionate outdoor people protect the places and experiences they love. But POW also cares about the banal indoor recreation of politics, such as helping elect Democrats to Congress and shilling for the Partisan Inflation Reduction Act. POW has a C4 dark money arm that, that gives 100% cycle after cycle to elect Democrats. POW's C3 arm receives support from ordinary outdoor enthusiasts, but also from notorious political actors. Those include a nonprofit in Arabella Advisors Network, the biggest dark money network on Earth, which takes in billions every election cycle, including large sums from a foreign donor, yet oddly goes unmentioned by Congress's fiercest dark money hawks. Powell also receives money from the Tides Foundation, a donor-advised fund provider, and from the David Rockefeller Fund, which also donates to the Tides and Arabella Networks. POW helps corral into political campaigns trade associations that should know better, including the National Ski Areas Association. The association's ties to POW appear in its climate challenge reports, which require all climate challengers to do such things as endorse letters from groups like POW, Citizens Climate Lobby, and We Are Still In. We Are Still In is an environmentalist pressure group underwritten by left-wing billionaire Michael Bloomberg, while Citizens Climate Lobby has received hundreds of thousands of dollars from Enron billionaire John Arnold, as well as funding from Arabella. Groups like POW are so compromised politically that they never mention powerful threats to outdoor recreation from their radical environmentalist allies. Obviously, for the foreseeable future, outdoor recreation absolutely depends on inexpensive transportation for ordinary Americans. That means fossil fuels for cars, trucks, boats, motorcycles, and planes and it means roads and parking. Just consider what outdoor trade groups say and the Biden administration brags about. The Outdoor Recreation Roundtable's president says, 
We have the best public lands, waters, and outdoor businesses in the world, right here in the United States. But if Americans can't access them with sound roads, then we're missing out on economic opportunity and undermining our American outdoor heritage. I think she expects those roads to be traveled by people who aren't rich enough to own Teslas. Then there's the Biden administration, bragging that its National Parks and Public Land Legacy Restoration Fund will increase visitor access by restoring and repairing roads and parking areas. After all, how many hikers can reach Yellowstone without the use of jet fuel or gasoline? How many skiers visit Aspen or Park City without flying on a plane? Ending jet travel and sales of gasoline, or just hiking their costs, would devastate outdoor recreation which means a lot of environmental extremist groups pose serious threats to outdoor recreation. Just last year, the Sierra Club's magazine ran a long article that began by lionizing a man who hasn't ridden a plane in five years. It ended with hopes that planes will disappear in a few decades. Jet travel is also denounced by groups like Stay Grounded and Flight Free USA. In the world they and their donors fight for, how can an Aspen ski resort or a fishing outfitter on Montana's Blackfoot River survive? More threats come from the ESG movement's effort to debank all fossil fuel-related companies. If this movement and its rich leaders like Larry Fink have their way, an ordinary American who depends on a gas-powered car for transport will never drive to Yosemite, and no fisherman will travel in a gas-powered boat across the beautiful Tennessee lakes of my childhood. These threats to outdoor recreation deserve their own hearing. Thank you. Dr. Gomes, yes, sir. do you uh, support a price on carbon emissions? It depends on the purpose at this stage, um, but I would certainly, I would prefer a regulatory intervention at this point. Uh, I think you've done, um, IRA made a lot of progress in addressing climate change. Um, I think at this stage, it, I would ask the question of why you want a carbon tax, but um, well, I let's say it would produce revenues to address the problem that you testified about. It would produce considerable revenue, would it not? Uh, depends how it's set up, but certainly has that potential. So cap and trade could do the same thing. Yeah. I think those are good solutions in so theory. Implementing in, in, them is a they're little They're consistent with economic market theory, is that correct? All the way back to Milton Friedman uh, putting I a price on pollution. I strongly prefer consumption taxes to income taxes, absolutely. If and you would consider a pollution like fee uh, a consumption tax? Absolutely. Okay, so you support... It wouldn't be my favorite solution. I prefer cap and trade for sure, yeah. or regulatory interventions, but absolutely, yes. Okay, and the effect of that would be to generate revenue, and then you could determine where the revenue what went, but presumably it. you could lower uh, debt and deficits, correct? Or you could reduce distortionary income taxes, or you could increase yeah. funding... you could swap it for other taxes. You could do various things, yes. And it would be a better tax than other ones in terms of the choices that the public makes. I would say, in theory, yes. I haven't seen a study in recent years that just, just yeah. goes through the numbers yeah. and, and assesses that. There are ways but to screw theory, up the details, but in theory, it, it in would do In theory, that. should work much yeah. better. And it would reduce pollution for obvious reasons. Again, I have not seen a study on that. But um, I would assume the whole, so. I would right? Assume so. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole purpose of... I would assume so. I, as yeah. I, I would it would be perfect. fair to assume that if you put a fee or a penalty on Absolutely. carbon emissions that that would have the effect of reducing carbon emissions? I would strongly prefer that to the type of industrial policy of IRA. Yeah. But the IRA has done good in terms of uh, addressing climate change. You're, you, you support that, at least. Um, Quoting your earlier From statement. an economic standpoint, as an, as an expert economist, I'm not entirely sure. I think the data is very, very preliminary. I think the cost of the IRA has certainly been projected to be much higher than what we originally um, assessed or CBO originally assessed, so I can't tell you that yeah. it makes economic sense. Um, from a climate standpoint, I'm not an expert on that. Are you familiar with the Deloitte study I've that estimates a 100 and, well, $200 trillion swing I between think. now and 2070, depending on whether or not we get climate policies right, that will be uh, the cost of doing nothing will total $178 trillion between now and 2070, whereas decarbonizing to reach net zero could grow the global economy by $43 trillion, the difference being 178 plus 43 equals, what, 200 and 
2021. I'm not familiar. The numbers seem implausibly large to me. I suspect that also global. Okay. Well, we'll send it to you. You can yes. you can uh, comment on it. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. McKenna, the uh, New Hampshire statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan uh, was just developed. What does it tell us about uh, economic costs and what climate change portends for the uh, outdoor recreation economy in New Hampshire? Yes, thank you, Senator. So New Hampshire just went, underwent our statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. Um, it was led by the New Hampshire State Parks Department and over 300 outdoor recreation providers were interviewed on impacts from five different climate areas, and those impact areas were winter, summer, water and wildlife, forests, and extreme weather. 78% reported loss of outdoor recreation access, 75% reported negative travel impacts, and operational impacts were reported ac across planning, maintenance, finances, staffing, safety, visitor use management, and communication. The most significant climate operational impacts in the study reported 80% on maintenance, routine, preventative, and corrective, 74% on finances, revenue, operating costs, capital investments, and bids, and 70% on planning, things like program offerings, marketing, and facility design. Um, and Ms. Hutchinson, you mentioned something that I put a metal asterisk on in your testimony, which is the nonprofit crisis hotline mm -hmm serving the professional guide community. Right. What is that about? I know. <laughs> um, we're dealing with something that um, our guides are referring to as eco-grief in, in the outdoor guiding community. And uh, there's a nonprofit organization called the Red Side Foundation. Uh, we kind of have adopted from Idaho over in Montana because we saw that Idaho had this nonprofit set up. and and they've come over to set it up in Montana now as well. And what it is is it's um, a crisis hotline for guides, any guides in the outdoor professional network. And uh, they call it initially and um, get some counseling and then get set up for long-term counseling resources. And um, it's free. And um, we've, at my company, have now uh, increased our counseling opportunities to further that counseling that our guides may need after those sessions run out from the Red Side Foundation. And so that's the added corporate expense at our company is we're offering that to guides for free. And um, the reason that guides are calling the number and getting those resources is because it, when we're sitting here in this room, I feel like it's the perfect climate controlled environment in your office here. And then if you could just imagine suddenly it's on fire and then it's flooded, and then it's full of rocks, and then it's completely dry, and then your skin feels like it's falling off, and then it's pouring rain, and then it's super hot, and then it's super cold, and then suddenly your staple doesn't have any staplers in it. The staples would be fish in our situation. <laughs> and um, so this is kind of what our guides are dealing with every single day throughout their summer months, and that's just kind of that physical discomfort that they're experiencing out on the water. Um, the psychological discomfort comes from the fact that we have people's lives in our hands, very literally. Like we're taking people down the river and we're on top of that trying to give them an exceptional experience and take care of them and um, have them enjoy their time there too. Uh, they're also asking us these really tough questions in the midst of all this. Why are these things happening? And so guides are needing to now kind of be a counselor for them and, and we're not qualified to do that. So they're saying, I will try to find out for you. I will help you get these resources. I will give you information. And then they need to go and talk to somebody about you know, best ways to get through their day that way. The uh, number one thing that counselors at the Red Side Foundation tell me that guides struggle with is transition. So in, a, in you know, your regular job, a seasonal outdoor recreation job, there's a big transition after your season ends. And that can be really challenging. You lose your team, um, working together, eating together, um, you know, camping together as a team all summer long, and then suddenly you lose that team. Now those guides are going out into another challenging outdoor recreation environment like the ski industry. So now they're going out of the river and then into the mountains where they're finding additional outdoor recreation challenges that are because of this unstable environment. So it's a year-round kind of stress for them where they're constantly transitioning. 
The financial transition is extremely challenging for our guides because they don't know if they're going to have a job next summer. They're traveling around from river to river, from mountain to mountain. Um, they just don't have stability within their jobs. And it, that part, not knowing where your money is going to be, is really tough. We had guides last summer who had to leave early because we ran out of water. And they just weren't getting the trips because we had so many guides and not enough water. And um, that was really tough for them as well. So seeing them go and trying to get them to come back and me saying I'm doing the best that I can to try to talk with our elected leadership to see what we can do for you is why I'm here. Not to mention that they love what they do. They love it. Senator Grassley. Senator Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Vice Chairman. Mr. Schumacher, welcome. You were, uh, who invited you here today? I came with Protect Our Winters. Right. Um, but you're here on behalf of the Democrats or the Republicans? I'm here on behalf of the outdoor enthusiasts around America. Okay. You were contacted by Senator Whitehouse's staff? I personally uh, came with Protect Our Winters, so I don't okay. know how that went okay. exactly. Okay. Um, what is what is carbon dioxide? <laughs> I'm I went to high school, but that's uh, carbon dioxide is a, a gas. Okay. I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a professional to talk about carbon dioxide so much, but well, you, you want us to abolish it, right? No, I, <laughs> there's always going to be carbon dioxide. Right. So so what is it you want us to do? I. Now, let me back up, because I, I want to, I mean, you're here as an expert. Tell me more about what carbon dioxide is. I'm here as an expert cross-country skier who sees the changes in my winters and the landscape that I live in in Alaska. And so carbon dioxide is, what I see it as is, you know, it's a gas that exists in our atmosphere. And what? Is it the major part of our atmosphere? Or? It's a huge part of our atmosphere, yeah. It's actually a very small part of our atmosphere. Well, okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know. What are you asking specifically? Uh, well, you said we need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. I'd like to know first if you know what it is. You want us to abolish fossil fuels? I never said that. You never have said that? No. Okay. What, what do you think we ought to do with fossil fuels? What will we do with fossil fuels? Yeah. Should we make any changes? I would like to see a decrease in the use of fossil fuels. I think there's a possibility to use more electric generation. Okay. Over, uh, over what period of time? 10 years, 50 years, 100 years? That's not... I would like to see it come as fast as possible while continuing... How fast? On. Sorry? How fast? I'm not, I don't have a good answer know? for that, no. Okay, you just think, well, uh, how, how much will it cost for us to uh, become carbon neutral in the United States by 2050? I'm not a professional on that. I don't have an answer. You don't have any idea? No. You, you just think we ought to spend the money? I'm not an economist. Yeah, but it's going to cost money. You realize that. Yeah, but we've also talked about the, the trade-off of what the cost of climate change as emergencies will cost in the future also. So. Right. But it's going to cost trillions of dollars to become carbon neutral by 20,050, right? I do not know. You don't know. You just think we ought to do it. I, I don't have a great answer for you, but I think okay. I would like if to we spent, If we emissions. spent those trillions of dollars and became carbon neutral by 2050 in the United States, um, which you advocate, how much will it reduce world temperatures? I don't have an answer for that. You don't know? No. You just think we ought to spend the money and then see what happens? I think, as an athlete, I think if we spend that money and invest in our future, hopefully those temperatures stop rising and maybe the snow at least stabilizes where it is for me. But yeah, I don't think anyone knows for sure. I don't know anyway. Well, when, 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 my colleagues invite witnesses to come to us to tell us, uh, advise us on passing legislation. I always check out the background of our witnesses. 
because I'd like to know who I'm talking to. Um, I'm, I checked yours out, Mr. Schumacher, um, and I want to be sure I understand it as I evaluate your testimony. Uh, on June 8, 2020, you tweeted, I'm going to quote, the war on drugs was intentionally created to incarcerate black people en masse, end quote. The war on drugs, you said, was intentionally created to incarcerate black people en masse. Who, who intentionally created the war on drugs to put black people in jail? Who were you talking about? I don't remember typing that. You don't? No. It's on your Twitter feed. Maybe a retweet. I don't know. I haven't used that in a while. Well, also, even it if it's a retweet, like it's... it shows your support, right? Maybe, yeah. I. But it's not the topic of this conversation. I right, think. right. But it has to do with you're here giving us advice, and I just kind of like to know a little bit more about you. Yeah, I'm, you. I mean, I'm here as an athlete giving you my story and what okay. I've seen in my on, field. on August 27th of 2020. You tweeted this quote, I'm going to quote, police are paid with taxpayer dollars. If they are not answerable to us, we can demand new service, and that's what this is. Abolish the police in favor of that new service, end quote. You think we ought to abolish the police, do you? Again, not the topic I'm here to talk about today. I know, but, but you tweeted it. Do you think we ought to abolish the police? That's not what I'm here to talk about. Should we do that before or after we get rid of fossil fuels? I'm not going to address that. That's yeah, you don't want to address it. Okay. Uh, let me ask you about one more of your tweets. On August 26, 2020, you tweeted, there's a picture. I'm not going to describe the picture, but you said, quote, your words, not mine. It's on your Twitter feed. The, quote, this is what systemic racism looks like. The Los Angeles Police Department is literally policing only the Black Lives Matter side. End quote. What do you mean by that? This is still off topic. No, it's not. You're here as an expert telling us, <laughs> advising us, and I'm asking you about your, your, your background. I'm here as an athlete to talk about the effects of climate change on my sport. Okay, let's go back. Well, I'm almost out of time. Senator, you're well out of time, and we have other senators waiting, so okay. please wrap up when you have a moment. All right. Th thank you all for your testimony. Senator Grassley. Dr. Holmes, uh, you uh, indicated your concern about races, particularly uh, triggering the loss of market confidence because of the national debt, so you urge fiscal responsib uh, responsibility. Uh, do you believe excessive federal spending or climate change is a greater economic concern for our committee to address? At this moment, I believe the fiscal concerns are more important and more urgent. Okay. I think um, I will take issue with a couple of things that Senator Whitehouse said, if I may. Uh, I think. Um, there is no question climate change is incredibly disruptive. It's costly. There is a risk, a risk of impending disaster. I agree with that. But I think you can, if you believe that, I think you can be proud that you've taken plenty of, of action already to address it. I think the budget crisis is far more pressing, and I think you're greatly underestimating the damage that will do. And I think if that, we have a budget crisis, you will not have the ability to address climate change, no matter how much you care about it. And, and I. I strongly believe that is the most pressing threat, existential threat to our economy. Uh, also to you, uh, uh, Chairman Powell said this, quote, it is well past time we all have an adult conversation about fiscal responsibility. What would that adult conversation entail and, what, uh, and when should we be having that? You should have it now. I, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert in Washington's um, um, way of, of doing business, but I can understand the pain of 
the sort of adjustment that I'm asking for. I realize both parties, both of you have to come together and have some sort of agreement. I, I do, th I just think that's the reality of it. Um, but there's no question, you look at the trend lines, the growth of entitlements is unsustainable. I think certainly the tax revenues could go up a couple of points, I think there's room for that. But you look at just the latest proposal of the president and, and our own simulations from the Wharton budget model, there's just not enough revenue there to address the fiscal crisis, there just isn't. Unless you're willing to consider across the board increases in taxes, and, and they're by law supposed to go up on December 31st, 2025 anyway, uh, there just isn't enough revenue in the proposals to stop this. I think you need to deal with the entitlement issues. Uh, you need to think about it and, and you need to come together, I would say, urge you to come together and find a solution that addresses this problem. You may not have 10 years. Um, one of the lessons that I, we've had two warnings in the last 18 months and one that I would point out to you is the UK experience in the fall of 2022. In the space of five days, one bad budget for a country that had a debt to GDP ratio below what it is now in the US, a country that had a lot of credibility, not the same as the US, experienced a change in interest rates of 4%, almost 5% in five days. That just happened overnight, essentially, five days. Um, that was just a sudden loss of confidence in fiscal policy. That could happen next year. That could happen next year. If it does happen, you will not have the resources to do any of the things we're talking about here. You may not even have the resources to pursue IRA, which is gonna cost us another 700 billion or so over the next 10 years. Um, um, Mr. Walter, we've heard testimony from multiple witnesses through 15 hearings that we've had on this subject. Your testimony highlights the strength of the American outdoor recreation economy. What do you think is at the core of this testimony and how does dark money compare between left-leaning ca ca causes and right-leaning? Uh, well, the dark money numbers are, are very clear uh, for the 2018 cycle, 2020 cycle, 22 cycle. Uh, in all cases, the, the left uh, and the Democratic Party uh, did far better. And Open Secrets, which is the best source on this sort of thing and is uh, not a conservative source, uh, just recently published uh, preliminary numbers for the 24 cycle, which uh, continue to show left-wing Democrat dominance uh, in dark money. Uh, I'll submit my other questions for answer in writing. Great. Thank you very much. Let me um, thank the witnesses for coming in. Um, <clears throat> you bring both the voice of a trillion dollar industry here, um, and also the voice of people who still live in the outdoors and are experiencing the changes that fossil fuel pollution is wreaking on our world in a very firsthand and immediate way. Um, there is something quite painful about going back to a place you have loved and finding it changed for the worse with Nothing that you can do about it because forces beyond your control are doing it grievous damage. So thank you for coming here to push back a little bit on those forces beyond your control. Thank you for providing testimony relevant to that subject. And um, I would simply note with respect to uh, Dr. Gomes' um, comment back to me during his uh, question and answer with uh, our uh, wonderful ranking member, that actually a significant price on carbon emissions would be a twofer. We actually could do something about uh, climate change in a big way uh, in an environment in which uh, we're trying to bring down debt and deficit really depends, the bill that I've drafted is $2 trillion over 10 years. That's a very significant piece of revenue. The problem is that people just don't want to do that. But the solution is right in front of us, and it both addresses the debt and the deficit side and the climate risk that we've heard such uh, significant expert testimony from, from people like, you know, chairman of sovereign banks and uh, major insurance company chief executives and 
the chief economist of Freddie Mac, um, the top uh, advisors through Milliman of the insurance industry. Um, so again, I urge that we look at the solutions that are right in front of us and get ahead of this problem before it's too late. Um, the record will remain open for 24 hours. 24 hours for anybody who wants to ask you guys a question. We will get those right out to you, and we would ask that you turn around answers if you get those questions within a week so we can circulate them through the committee. And uh, with all of that, the hearing is concluded.